How we doing, guys? Great. Don't know yet. Uh, Bill Nagy hurt his ankle yesterday in the early part of that blue practice, and he kind of fought his way through it. And uh, we'll just monitor it day by day. Uh, he's not going to practice anytime real soon, uh, but we're certainly hopeful he'll recover quickly. Still in the early stages of evaluating it, though. Jason, how do you feel about Jerry hopping up on stage yesterday and inviting fans to watch you guys beat the Giants' ass? <laughs> uh, Jerry Jones owns this football team, and he has owned it for 23 years, so he can do anything he wants. Would you like to guarantee that you'll beat, say, like Philadelphia's ass? <laughs> no, we don't make any guarantees. Uh, around here. Uh, we're going to work hard every day to put a, a great football team together. We're in the process of doing that. We just finished day one yesterday, Dale, and we're getting ready for day two right now. What is it you uh, What is it you learn about a player during this stage of training camp, or, or can you learn about a player? Oh, I think you can learn a ton about players. And uh, one of the things you learn as a player in this league early on is that there are a lot of people watching you. And uh, they're watching at a lot of different levels, uh, the position coach, the coordinator, the head coach. We have personnel people. So you're constantly evaluating players really in everything that they do, how they handle themselves in a meeting, how they handle themselves in a walkthrough, certainly how they produce in practice, how quickly they learn, uh, how they handle different adversities, how they handle success, um, and then certainly their ability and their talent level to be able to play and do the things you want them to do. So uh, there are a lot of eyes on these guys every day. We talk about our players a lot. And um, that's a really important part of, of understanding how good the player is and how good he can be. Is there a, another conditioning test scheduled for guys who failed the first time? It's not scheduled right now. Uh, they're involved in what we're calling remedial running to get themselves uh, ready to practice. And before they can practice, they will run that conditioning test. We don't feel like it's a good idea, though, to just send them out there every day and run the conditioning test and see if they make it. We need to make sure they're getting ready to run the conditioning test, which in turn will help them be ready to practice football. How big a black mark is it in your mind for a guy like Andre Holmes to start this way when he has this kind of an opportunity maybe in front of him? You know, I told you guys yesterday that a lot of it, uh, we're not going to make any excuses for anything. Certainly three guys not passing the conditioning test. Uh, we don't always necessarily think that it's because someone um, wasn't doing anything. It's more like he might have been doing the wrong things. You know, for some young players, each of those guys you can evaluate differently. But, uh, you know, Andre's a guy who's very conscientious, but to be candid with you, he was doing a lot more long distance running. Uh, and he wasn't ready to do what he needed to do. So uh, it's a good learning experience for him as a young player. And uh, he just needs to follow the prescribed running. And if he had done that, he had done what the 87 other guys were able to do in the conditioning test. He didn't do that, and he's going to learn from it, and he's going to be away from our team for a little bit until he's ready to practice the way we need to practice. Was it more disappointing if you had two veterans fail that test, especially if Poole has been in the league a little bit? Uh, well, again, each of those guys has their reasons, their explanations, and really, that doesn't really matter. The fact is they didn't get it done. Uh, you know, Brodney has not been around the off-season program. He similarly was running a lot more long distance, and uh, it doesn't get you ready to play football, you know. Uh, we talked about it earlier today that you could be a marathoner. You could be in the greatest shape to run 26.2 miles of anybody in the world. You probably wouldn't do very well on that conditioning test. It's designed to get you ready to play football and to practice football the way we need to have it practiced. What was your impression of Morris Claiborne in his first uh, full practice of the game? Well, Morris is a young player, and there's a, there's a lot for him to learn. He had three practices in Dallas last week and he had his first practice in training camp yesterday so he has a lot to learn uh, but all the things that we liked about him coming out you start to see uh, really on a daily basis and uh, he's trying to understand first and foremost the scheme and what we're asking him to do and then maybe more than that the technique of how to play at this level and uh, you certainly see flashes of him doing things really really well you see the instincts you see the athletic ability uh, but at the same time he has to learn with every rep he gets he has good competition. He's going against some really good receivers. We're going to challenge him every snap. So, uh, is Beasley number 14? Yes. Oh, I think any time you're a young player and you have good experience veteran players around you, it's really important for you to just watch them play. And uh, you talked about you know, watching a guy in a meeting, watching him in a walkthrough and evaluating that way. That's how young players can learn from veteran players. And we're fortunate that we have a lot of leaders on this team that we as coaches can say, Watch that guy. Watch how he conducts himself and everything that he does. I think if you're a young player playing corner 
and you got a chance to be around a guy like Brandon Carr and see how he goes about it really every day in his preparation and then how he practices, those are the most valuable things that a young player can learn. Talk about Ron Leary, you guys were high on him after the draft and so he's out there rotating with Arkin. He is. Uh, he's getting an opportunity. You know, we, we signed Mackenzie Bernardo, as you know, and he hasn't been able to practice for us yet. So it gives a guy like Arkin some more snaps and gives, gives a guy like Ron Leary some more snaps. You know, Ron did a good job in that pre-training camp uh, last week at Valley Ranch, and we feel like he's worthy of getting some snaps, you know, certainly with the second group and at times with the first group. You know, we have some guys banged up in the interior of our offensive line, so that's allowing those younger guys to get some more reps anyway. So uh, the biggest thing for those guys is, is to go attack those reps. Oftentimes a young player will go in there and be a little hesitant. He's kind of looking around, what does the coach want me to do? Just go play. We'll clean up the mistakes. I think Ron's done a nice job of that. Is there any chance in the flu practices you might move somebody in that third spot? That you have the two centers, but any shift anybody inside? Yeah, one of the things we're trying to do is work some of those tackles and some of those guards who haven't really snapped. We, we need to have a third center available, certainly with Kowalski down and Nagy down. We need to be able to do that. And sometimes that can be problematic, uh, candidly, during training camp. You know, guys have a hard time making that adjustment if they haven't done it, and it can be pretty disruptive to your entire practice when the ball's on the ground. But, uh, you know, I tell those guys all the time, I told McGee, I said, McGee, what room are you in? And he says, I'm in 822. I said, what room is Harlan Gunn in? I mean, he's, in he's in 519. You know, make sure you guys know each other. You know, at, late at night after the meeting's over, don't be smoking cigars with Mike Wojcik out in the front. You know, go to each other's room and take snaps. So when you get those limited number of reps in practice, you're ready to take advantage of them. The ball's not on the ground. You talk a lot about the importance of creating competition. How do you create that competition for Phil Costa now when the two guys who's supposed to be competing with are injured? Well, you, you, you try to create competition certainly for a spot on a team. A guy trying to make a team, have a role on a team, be a starter on a team. You try to do that as best you can. But Phil Costa, it, it's pretty competitive for him every time he, he breaks the huddle and has to go against our defensive linemen. So that's a competitive environment we're similarly trying to create. And uh, if you look at the early part of the, the team portion of our practice, we actually call the period the compete period. And we're going to put the ones against the ones, and we're going to create a competitive situation based on what the situation's work is in that practice. Uh, yesterday was just first and second down, and we did what we call drive starter plays. We ran three of them, and uh, we're going to try to evaluate our ones against our ones in that kind of environment. Today's a third down day. We'll create some third down situations, and on and on as we go through training camp. So certainly you want to create competition within your roster to see who, what role a player is going to have but you also have to create competitive situations in practice to get these guys ready to play in the season. Speaking of that, uh, is Ratliff going to be, do you know when he'll be ready to, to go during the afternoon practice? Uh, we don't know right now. He's getting some good work here in the, uh, in the walkthrough periods where he's not having to go full speed. Uh, you know, he hurt his foot in the spring, so really missed the entire uh, offseason from a football standpoint. Uh, but he's in good shape. Uh, we just got to make sure that we're, we're cautious on that foot so he doesn't take any backward steps. Beyond his physical tools, what impresses you most about Marco Murray? Oh, I think he's a very impressive kid uh, from a maturity standpoint. And, uh, you know, he's a guy who played very young at Oklahoma, and, and I think his numbers and his production will indicate that to you. And he just has a mature demeanor about him as a person, first and foremost. And that's an important thing when you're playing in the NFL. Um, I think that's what allowed him to transition as easily as, it, as, it was, as he did last year. I think the other thing is he's a mature player from a technical standpoint. You can tell he's a good runner, he has good vision, but a lot of guys are good runners. Uh, first and foremost, that's his job. But then you ask him to you know, you know, run a route out of the backfield maybe that he hasn't run before, and he understands what you're asking him to do as a coach very quickly, and he goes and does it. And uh, from a pass protection standpoint, it's the same thing. He hasn't had a tremendous amount of experience doing a lot of these different things, but he has kind of a, a, an instinct and intuition that the really good players have. So he has a maturity level that way as well. He said he learned to watch film here with the Cowboys. Can you talk about how he did that? He learned to watch film. Well, uh, I can tell you how we watch film. Uh, I don't know specifically what he learned from that, but you know we try to critically analyze what we're asking our players to do. It's really a simple process. There's so many different ways to learn, and uh, you know we really talk about this a lot as coaches. Is how do different players learn the game of football? They learn by what we say to them, 
They learn by what we show them on a written page. They learn by how we teach them, how we demonstrate to them, and uh, walkthroughs, practices, those are all important, but a really valuable tool is, is watching what you've done. And uh, I think the golf industry knows this. A lot of you guys have probably gone to some golf school and they've evaluated your swing. It's too flat, it's too, the angle's too steep, your hands aren't where they're supposed to be, all of that stuff. We try to do the same kind of thing here in football. And uh, I've actually talked to some businessmen in Dallas uh, here in, in, in the past off season, and we, and we kind of told them about the process. And it's not unique to us. People have been doing this in football forever. Uh, but, but even if you're trying to learn the car business, sometimes visual stuff can help you more. People process that information maybe a little bit easier. So uh, we just go through that process with our players. We try to learn, we try to understand how they learn best. Uh, DeMarco's a guy who, who I think understands the game uh, fairly easily, and uh, he, he's certainly a joy to coach that way. Same thing, uh, DeMarcus Ware talked about guys having all the playbooks and everything on the iPads, you know, really transition to that. How does that help? Well, it's really an interesting thing for us, again, as teachers, because you have to understand how people learn. Uh, from a convenience standpoint and from a paper-saving standpoint, it's pretty darn good. Uh, you're not always resubmitting things. You know, you're not, you don't have this big playbook to start with, and when we have changes, you're saying, okay, take that section out, and then you're asking 90 guys to put a new section of 25 plays in. We're out of that world. We're into the uploading world on an iPad. Uh, but again, we, we talk a lot about how players learn. And uh, one of the things that concerned me with the iPad was this idea that players would be sitting in a meeting room and then just kind of scrolling along on their iPad and do 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 and 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 we understand that these kids have grown up in more of a, more of a video age than we did, uh, but at the same time, sometimes there's a feeling that this stuff goes out into outer space. So we really need to emphasize note taking, uh, the idea that you're following along. This is a great visual. Uh, look at, at the installation that we're trying to put in for that day, but at the same time you need to write. You need to hear a guy say something, demonstrate, we got the video, but at the same time we think a big part of the learning process is writing things down. I know it is for me when I'm trying to learn something. So uh, the way these things work is you can write it down on a notebook, but you also write it down on the actual iPad. So we have styluses for these guys and you, you hit draw and you can draw on the actual iPad, then you can save it and Da, 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 da. So it's been important for us to teach those guys how to do that because uh, like we've talked before, we have an aggressive installation and new information is coming every day and if you can't keep up with it, you're going to have a hard time playing. Not just the playbook, but the, the film, the cut-ups and all that are all right there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and that's an important part of it as well. You see, you see some written words and then you see a, a, a video uh, copy of what that is. You see a guy in an NFL game running that play that we're trying to install. So I think that's an important part of the learning as well. What are your coaches doing with the technology? Some better uh, than others. You know, There's some old school guys who take a tremendous amount of pride in being old school guys. I think in some ways that's a rationalization. And I think we all fall into that sometimes, but uh, we're really sensitive to the learning part of it, though, because I think it's really important. And uh, you've heard me say this before, day one installation is over. Now we're on to day two. A lot more information coming in than day two is over. You know, we like to think that we have carryover from day one to day two to day three, and they build on each other. That's an important part of teaching. But at the same time, there's a lot more information that comes in every day, and you've got to keep up with it. In terms of learning, when you see the Giants in New England in the Super Bowl, and both teams are ranked near the bottom and running the ball and the right at the bottom of the defense. How do you decide if that's an anomaly or if, if that's more about the way the game is headed, but it's just about throwing the football? <clears throat> well, I think there are certainly some trends that happened last year in the NFL that would make you go down that road a little bit, um, where maybe defense isn't quite as important, or maybe running the ball is not quite as important. Maybe it's all about high-powered offenses. And certainly you need to play good offensive football to win in this league. But I would argue you need to be good in all three phases. I think if you look at those teams, they probably were pretty darn good in red zone defense, where they might have been giving up a lot of yards, but they weren't giving up as many points. They probably were pretty good in the turnover ratio, and they did a lot of things that helped them win games that way. Uh, trust me, the Giants in, the, in New England, they're trying to get better running the football, and they're trying to get better uh, in terms of their yardage given up on defense. So they understand where they need to get better, just like we do in all the phases that we got to get better in. So I'd be a little bit careful of saying it's all about throwing the ball and don't worry about running and don't worry about playing defense. I'm pretty sure those guys who were in the Super Bowl last year aren't going down that road quite so quickly.
changed some, though, in your 20 years in terms of the balance? All at? teams are teams seem to be, this is anecdotally, teams seem to be throwing the ball more. Uh, but if you look at some NFL statistics, go back to the 60s and see how many times they were throwing the ball. Maybe the AFL influence. There was a lot of throwing at different, era, at different points in, in the NFL. So we've got to be careful about saying uh, this is a trend and it's never going back. I think the important things about being physical, executing, playing well at crunch time in all three phases, I think those are the things that ultimately win, and teams are going to find different ways to do that. You guys going in pads tomorrow for the first time, do you give them a, it's the first day, don't go out there a thousand miles an hour and blow everything up? That would be that way. Oh, I want them to play a thousand miles an hour. There's no question about that. Uh, but you have to understand how to, how to practice, and we talk about that really all the time. We're trying to create competitive situations in everything that we do. Every time we snap the ball, we want it to be competitive. We want guys to understand they've got to get after each other. That's a really important part of football. You have to do that on a consistent basis. At the same time, you have to understand how to practice. The specifics are stay away from the quarterback, stay off the ground, you don't hit we're not tackling receivers, we're not tackling backs, we're not doing all that stuff. But, you know, we have thuds and we have different ways that we conduct the different drills throughout practice. And we try to be really clear in communicating that to our players as to what we want. And it's an ongoing process. Literally, we'll go into a meeting at night and say, hey, guys, this is what we want. This is how you practice. Or we'll say, guys, this is not what we want. Okay? Stay off his feet. Don't die for that loose ball. Don't do the things that are going to put us in jeopardy of losing a player. You talk about uh, c competitive positions. You're, you're not talking about starting jobs, though, are you? I mean, uh, if you're starting 22 in September, you can pretty much name those right now, can't you? Oh, I think realistically there are a number of guys who we think are going to be starting players for us, and I think you could name them too. But there are some other spots where it's absolutely competitive. And, you know, we talk about being a starter, but we also talk about roles. You know, there are a lot of different personnel groups that go out there. There are a lot of different situations, and if you're a starter, in the 11 personnel group, or you're a starter in this kind of a situation or that kind of a situation. So, you know, whether you're an actual starter, one of the first 11 that goes out there, you know, that's one thing. And, and we don't have a, all those ironed out quite yet uh, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination. But then there are roles within that that you're certainly trying to compete for. To Dale's question, though, when you talk about the rotation with Carter and Connor, you know, is there a plan for that, for the number of reps that both those guys are getting at that inside linebacker spot? A plan for practice? plan for them, but for your evaluation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we want to make sure those guys uh, get, get, a, get a competitive number of reps. And, and one of the things I learned a long time ago in football is you have to understand that there's going to be a tape of you. Oftentimes players are saying, okay, how did that guy do? Okay, i got to do better than this guy. You know, uh, a quarterback's competing for a job. He kind of subconsciously wants the guys competing with to throw that three route over the receiver's head, and now he says, this is my opportunity. That's not how we evaluate players. How we evaluate players is this is a player. Let's watch his tape. Is he capable of doing what we're asking him to do? And then let's watch this guy's tape. Is he capable? So at some point as a player, you have to put the competition out of your mind and do your job to the best of your ability, and that's how we try to do it as coaches. If Dan Connor's in the second group, we're going to watch his plays, and we're going to say, how did Dan Connor do? Now, there's a competitive part to that. If Dan Connor's in the twos going against the twos, we have to watch how he does that, but we also got to see him against the ones. And so we'll go through that process as well. We'll try to evaluate the best we can to make sure we can make the evaluation the best we can. Okay?